Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Good morning. My name is Jessica E, and I am an alcoholic. Hi, Hi, guys. <laughs> Um, I just wanted to start off by thanking the committee for inviting me. I, um, this has been an unbelievable experience so far, and I know it's just going to get better. So, um, I was asked when I was invited to come speak, um, like we were introduced, it's we hit bottom two. So, um, especially the last week, I really started thinking, like, what does that mean to me? And, um, you know, it's so broad, uh, emotionally, physically. Mentally, financially, judicially, um, you know, I, I, I think that I definitely came to all of, you know, I complete defeat in every single area, but it didn't all come at once. Um, and the one thing that became really apparent to me was that, you know, there's no true definition of what a bottom is. It, it leaves it broad and roomy, so it can include all of us any of us who come in with an honest desire to, to not want to drink anymore. So, um, I don't, I, I guess the, the first thing I, when I, uh, I guess I want to bring up is that, uh, it says in the 12 and 12, um, it talks about, um, hitting bottom and there's no, no definition of what it is. It just says that we must hit it. Um, so it's in the first chapter, and it talks about why it's so important that we hit it. And it says, um, it says, why this insistence that an alcoholic must hit bottom? It, it says that because few will sincerely try to practice the AA program unless we do. For practicing the remaining 11 steps means the adoptions of attitudes and actions that none of us could really think of taking. It talks about being honest and making restitution for harms done, for who cares about a higher power and meditation and prayer, who cares about self-sacrifice and times for our, and giving all of our time to others. And it says that, that the alcoholic self-centered in the extreme wouldn't think of it. We wouldn't, unless we had to do this to save ourselves. And so... Um, I mean, these are drastic actions that we take. But I mean, it's life or death for us. That's it. At 13 years old, I was a chronic alcoholic, and I was dying from acute alcoholism. You know, from the beginning, um, I, there was many people who tried to petition for me and try to intervene. Um, from an early age, New York State filed PINS petitions against me from the school and from my parents. and. Um, you know, they started trying to figure out what was wrong with me. And, um, you know, they did. They were giving me drug tests, and I was passing them with flying <laughs> colors. And, um, but I never got honest, and I never said that I had already t- taken my first drink. And, and periods of abstinence had me so wired that I was ready to crack. They couldn't understand why I was lying, and I was cheating, and I was stealing, and I wasn't able to show up. Um, 16, I stopped going to school. Um, I, by 17, um, I had my first DWI. By 19, I had my second. Um, and, you know, there was a lot of other stuff in between. I don't, definitely don't have time to go into a lot of that stuff. But there was a lot of charges. There was a lot of losses. Um, you know, I, I really, even at that, at that point, I just started losing everything. You know, um, there was, I really wanted to show up. Um, you know, I really started thinking that, you know, maybe if I start doing the things that I thought other normal people were doing, that maybe, that maybe, um, that it would make me okay. Um, you know, I wanted to show up as a daughter. I wanted to show up as a niece. I wanted to go to school. Um, I wanted to show up as a girlfriend. When I told you I was going to come home in a few hours and I showed up on a Tuesday, you know, like I really honestly wanted to do something different. Um, one of the things someone had reminded me like a couple of years ago, I, um, you know, I was like 17. I had my own place and because I had gotten kicked out and 
Um, I would just, I, I couldn't make it to school, but yet I was like talking about how I was going to cure cancer and I was going to become great and big. And I mean, I couldn't show up for my job. I couldn't do anything. Um, but, you know, my story is definitely a story of if nothing changes, nothing changes. And by the time I was 22, I was arraigned on my, on my third DWI, again, with a bunch of other stuff. Um, and I was falling to pieces. I mean, and that's the truth. Um, in my last, probably my last year of drinking, I, I probably didn't take a sober breath. Um, you know, I was living in a two-bedroom apartment that, you know, everything that people really like, like electricity, uh, cell phones, you know, basic things that people enjoy, you know, I stopped paying for, uh, which made it fun during my financial amends. Um, so, and I was living out of this, you know, box of clothing and, um, and nothing else in this place. And, like, I was waking up every morning with the shakes and panic attacks. And the only thing I could do was get out of my bed and, and like, waddle down, like, to, to the, or stumble down to the, to the kitchen and, and try to find the handle that I left from the night before. Um, uh, it was August 23rd of 2006. I was... Um, I faced my last court date. Well, I'll tell, uh, I guess it wasn't my last court date, <laughs> um, but it, it is my sobriety day. I'll tell you about that later. <laughs> um, it was my, that is my sobriety day. I was, um, I was sentenced to a year in our county jail in upstate New York. Um, and, and I arrived and, and you know, people my whole life had been telling me that if I just stopped drinking that I'd be okay. And, but here the, here's the thing is now I'm abstinent, I'm in this, I'm in the cell and I'm starting to lose it. I'm, um, showing up at mental health. They're, I'm telling them there's something seriously wrong with me. They're sending me back because I'm so aggressive. I'm, I can't sleep. I'm having panic attacks all the time, but I was always told if I just stopped drinking that I'd be okay. You know, um, I paused for that second and said it was my last time because my sponsees got a kick out of this, um, you know, within my first 30 days, I was arraigned on new felony assault charges, <laughs> dry as can be. And I don't know what's wrong with me because I'm not drinking. I'm not drinking. So I'm locked in the cell 23 hours a day, and, and I'm about to lose it. I don't really want to take, I, I really don't want to kill myself, but I know I can't take another moment living the way that I'm living. And um, it finally just, it, you know, I, I don't know what kind of bottom that's called, complete defeat, but I hit my knees and I just turned my life over because I could not take another moment living the way that I was living. And, um, you know, within a few, um, within a few days, uh, a woman showed up, or I was at the book cart and, cause they, uh, didn't let me out often. And, uh, they, um, this woman suggested I came to AA. And I was kind of offended. <laughs> but um, this woman, I was 23 at the time. She was 26. And she was in for a couple of DWIs, too. She was a felon offender as well. And, um, and it says in our big book that we have the key. Um, we have the key. We have something that we've never been, that nobody else has been given. We have the key to helping, to saving someone else's life. And just that moment when that woman said that, I had a just a pause where I, I thought about that moment when I, where when I hit my knees that night and I said, like, if God would show me a different way, that I'd be willing. Um, and by her reaching out, you know, I started my journey uh, in this program and on my new life. Um, you know, it's uh, it's in this program that you know through doing a fourth step, I I learned to be like rigorously honest and 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 really have honest self appraisal of myself. I learned that you know we're all of God's kids and we're just doing sometimes we're just doing the best with what we have. You know, um, you know through the fifth step that I I really started feeling my nearness to my Creator. I was able to you know, really have this level of humility that, not that I'm any better, but I'm also not any worse than any of us. You know, I'm just who I am, and I'm amongst you. Um, it was definitely through my amends process and 
and being able to go back and, and just really clean up as best as I can, you know, all the stuff of my past that I was able to start getting self-respect and dignity. You know, I started really, you know, by doing esteemable actions, we get self-esteem. Through um, constant self-appraisal, meditation, prayer, it says it, um, I think it's in the 11th step, um, in our 12 and 12, it talks about this unshakable foundation for life. And what that means for me is that no matter what I go through, I mean, I went through a lot of amazing experiences in sobriety, but I've also went through a lot of hard stuff as well. I've, I've you know, I've gotten a lot in sobriety as, uh, as well, and, and I've lost a lot. And some of it I haven't gotten back. But, um, you know, it's through that process that, and by doing this work, that I can, it means that I can walk through anything as a sober, graceful woman. And it's amazing. It's more than I could have ever asked for. Um, it's through the 12th step that, you know, that it's just, I, I have... I have so many experiences. I have a lot of amazing women. Um, and through strong sponsorship, I have a woman that I work with now in Montana, June Kay, um, that suits up and shows up for me. She is sitting there at 545 on Tuesday nights every single week, and she shows up for me. And, I, and I'm able to do that with my girls that I get to work with, and I'm honored to work with. Um, this fellowship, I mean, I've been able to really, you know, grow up in it and, and, and be able to feel a part of um, through service work, I mean, uh, God, I, this is where I, truly I've grown up in. I mean, I got involved really early. Um, I was, uh, when I came out of jail, I actually was a Bridging the Gap participant, um, where I, I was connected out of the treat, or out of the facility into Kingston. I was um, to the town I was going back into. And uh, right away, my sponsor had me getting involved with the Kingston Young Peoples. Um, I got involved with the Hudson Valley Young People, and I had got lots of service commitments, and I was able to serve my home group and, and these committees as well. Um, I moved to Long Island uh, when I was like two years sober, and I got involved in ho going to panels on hospitals and institutions. Um, I was a newsletter chair for uh, Long Island Young Peoples. Like, I was constantly, I mean, these are just a few of the things that I have been able to do. But it's like, by doing all that stuff, like, I started learning how to show up for school. I started sh learning to show up for family and events. And, and by showing up at my job, it's like, I really had no, nothing to give when I came here. And, um, and you guys filled me up. And you gave me what I needed and showed me by the things that you've done before me that I could do, I could do it. Um, so it was that sponsor that I was working with. Uh, um, after I was in Long Island, I went out to Montana for graduate school on a full fellowship. And um, I, I started working with June out there. And at that time, she was treatment chair. So she said, um, you know what? I need you to start going down to this meeting down at MCDC, which is a treatment center. I need a bridging the gap coordinator on my committee. I need you to sit and, and help me serve. And I said, okay. And, um, and you know, around during that time, I was engaged when I was in New York and to a wonderful guy in sobriety as well. And, you know, I landed up going to Montana. He landed up going to Washington, D.C. He had some amazing opportunities. And, um, and it really, it just... People change, you know, you move apart and things, our lives had awesome opportunities in different places. And uh, for six months, I would go to June and I'm like, please just tell me what to do. Tell me what to do. Please, I don't know what to do. I don't know what the right thing to do because we were still in this relationship. And uh, she'd be like, uh, you know, I, you're going to go down to MCDC every month. Make that your commitment. And I said, okay. <laughs> Next week, I'd show up. June, please just tell me what to do. Just tell me what to do. And she's like, you know what, I need you to apply to the jail. They really need volunteers down there. And she'd get right into her big book, not tell me anything. I'm like, okay. So the next week, I'm like, June, I really, she's like, you know what, you should go down to the recovery house. There's a bunch of girls, and none of them have licenses. You didn't have a license for a couple of years. You can give them rides. And I was like, oh, okay. Um, 
like eight commitments later, I was like, seriously? I'm not saying anything anymore at all. So, um, but you know what she did for me is she told me that through service work, if I continue working the steps, if I'm helping others, if I'm showing up in AA, that it's going to be in the midst of one of those service commitments. I'm going to be in, on a panel. I'm going to be looking out into the crowd and I'm going to like revisit that situation. And all of a sudden it's going to be crystal clear of what I need to do. And she said, it's because I'm going to be able to see the situation through God's eyes, not through Jessica's, not through fear or ego, or loss, or anything that gets in the mix. And, you know, it, it took a while through talking to other women and doing this stuff, but it became clear what the next right thing would be to do. And, and I was able to, like, do it respectfully and lovingly, and face-to-face -face flew back to New York. It was awesome, you know? And um, So I guess I, I, that was one of the losses. But um, um, So it was through that um, experience that... Yeah, it was through that experience of doing Bridging the Gap for a while because um, um, during that period of time, I was getting all these volunteers. We were starting to have a shift where we were now having a database in Montana, so I was able to upload the volunteers for our district. Um, and it was during that period of time, before all that, I was going up to some of the facilities and picking up the, the pieces of paper. And, um, and they weren't even allowing me in there because of my background. So I'd like have to go up there and I'd meet with the admin, pick up the papers, bring them back. Um, and during that time, June was actually the corrections chair at that time. So um, I think it was my third application to the jail. And, um, and one of those admins called her to tell her I was going to be denied again. And uh, June said, you know, this is one of my girls, you know, this is Jessica, she's been, been doing all this stuff. And through that connection, that woman, her name's Jackie, she's a friend of us, she shows up at a lot of our stuff, um, or our workshops and stuff. So she, uh, she petitioned for me and got me a sit down with, I think it was the lieutenant. And so June called me and she said, you show up there. And I went up there and, um, and I sat down and he said, why do you want to come into my facility? And I said, you know, honestly, I, I just want to be of use. If there's any way that, I, I just want to be of use. And, uh, and he said, so uh, what have you been doing the last couple of years? Because, I mean, he had my background. And, uh, <laughs> and um, I said, you know, sir, I've been able to go back to school. And, you know, I've been able to, I'm out here for graduate school, this and that. And he said, so what are you doing for work? And I said, well, I'm a chemist, the good kind. <laughs> so, and I, you know, after, it, needless to say, I, at the end, he shook my hand. And I've been... Um, been a volunteer and sitting on the corrections committee for for some time now as well so um, um, I think through all these experiences I, I um, that I've been able to you know have the opportunity to serve in these capacities um, Actually, this rotation for the 2015-2016 rotation um, for Area 40, which encompasses Montana, I've been entrusted to serve as their treatment facilities chair. So um, I have just, this has been the most amazing year for me. I've been able to work with district chairs all across Montana and bridging the gap chairs who just love Alcoholics Anonymous, loves us, and is just fired up to, to how we can be of use and how we could keep, you know, just trying to just help. And, um, you know, the truth is that I know there's a lot of times that I know there's a lot of people in here who do corrections and treatment work and you sit with sponsees and, and you don't know if you're helping, but, um, you know, I was a Bridging the Gap participant coming out of a jail, and, um, and, I, and I'm here. So I know that sometimes it gets hard, and sometimes it's, you know, you don't know if you're planting a seed or if you're helping, but the truth is that every seed counts. Every, every time you put your hand out, it counts. Um, so uh, I guess I should look, because there was, like, one other story I guess I wanted to say. 
Um, I guess I just wanted to talk about like how many, you know, I have, I've been able to touch on the different things of how my life has changed and just being able to go back to school and, you know, having a sober household. I'm, you know, my, my friends, my permanent roommate, you know, my whole, everything around me is, you know, sober and, and, and it's beautiful. Um, but the truth is that, you know, I have the story of this, there was this woman, um, I guess Bill would, like, describe her as, like, a prize slippy. Um, and this month, I'm going to be able to give her um, her four-year coin. And um, I was, on Tuesday, we were, sitting at, we were sitting at a meeting in the jail, and I was able to sit there with my sponsor, and I'm sitting with her, and I'm sitting with a couple of my other girls, and her sponsee, and her sponsee, sponsee. And we, you know, the room was packed, and... Um, and I think about this night, I had these qualifying exams, right? Um, and I thought, you know, I had to study, I had to study, I had to get into this lab. Um, you know, I had to because it, it was, I felt like this is why it, it kind of, my life had brought me where I was. I, like, met this amazing professor. It was doing, doing research that I wanted to do. And, um, and this woman calls me. And, she, you know, she was in and out for a year, and I would pick her up all the time. We'd go to meetings. She was young. She was, I think, 16 when she came in. And, uh, but I remember this, and I would always, no problem, go and, go and do it. Um, and this one night, I remember I had a pause because I had this exam first thing in the morning. But what my experience is, is that as long as I'm trying to align myself with God's will, as long as I'm trying to be of use to others, as Whenever I'm making decisions on myself or on my ego or the things that I think I need, like, they never work out. But those times when I, I really just honestly want to try to be of use to someone, I picked up, I paused and I looked at the phone because I know it's probably going to work. We're going to be out late, you know, sitting with her, lots of coffee. And, and I had this exam the next morning. And, um, but I went to go pick her up. And I just... I've had many experiences like that with women I've gotten to work with and who are sober and working with women. But Tuesday night, I like, I like looked across the room and I got to see her and I got to see her with her sponsees and we're all sitting together. And I just think like, the peace that I got at that moment, the fulfillment that I got at that moment was everything I've always been looking for. All the other amazing things that have happened in this journey is just a byproduct of, you know, what I do in these rooms. And my, my, my sponsor told me from the beginning that if I continue to work the steps, be a part of our fo fellowship, serve Alcoholics Anonymous, I might not have to take a drink again. I might not have to take a drink again. So, um, I guess, you know, with the topic we hit bottom two, you know, it's defined that you know, the lowest spot. I don't think I'm above this thing. I know that if I stop doing the things that you have laid out for me and that I know, you know, if I stop meeting with my sponsor, if I'm stop, you know, stop meeting with my girls, um, if I stop showing up for the jail, stop going to the treatment centers, if I stop doing these things that have continuously been a part of my recovery, I know that I could. I, I can leave. And so I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. But, but all I know right now is that I pray that I don't have to go any further. So um, I'm so grateful for this opportunity to be standing in front of you guys. Um, please just keep helping God's kids. This is proof that it works. I mean, this is amazing. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jessica. Um, I would now like to introduce our next speaker from Texas, Radu B. Hey, guys. My name is Radu. I'm an alcoholic. And I just want to say that it is a complete honor to be here in front of you guys. And also, it's very difficult to not be tempted to abuse the privilege of the sign language interpreter because she has to say what I say. <laughs> and that's a lot of power. Um, 
so, so bottom. Um, yeah, I, uh, when I came into the rooms, I heard a lot about this concept, and I really didn't like it because it was this thing that was so subjective to each and every person that I felt like there was a lot of room for us to find differences and kind of ostracize each other. And uh, I met a guy who was one of my counselors uh, in this youth program who had a concept about bottom being whenever you decide to stop digging. And that struck me as something really powerful because that's something we get to all apply to ourselves no matter what happened. Uh, bottom for me is when you're done, when you're sick of being sick. And that's something that even people outside of these rooms can relate to, much less us. So a little bit about myself. I live in Texas, which is a very nice place. <laughs> That stars at night shit is very real. If you do that right now, they'll all start clapping. Uh, but I'm from Romania, which is not a very nice place. Romania? See, she didn't even know my country. And I don't blame you. I don't blame you at all. Uh, yeah, yeah, no. Uh, growing up, I didn't feel like I belonged anywhere. And... A lot of that came from the fact that I always had a troubled sense of identity. But more than that, I didn't, I didn't have a framework for what necessarily family or, or close friendships or bonding with people was. Anytime I got anything, anywhere close to that, I started to implode and self-destruct. And that affects so many things. That affected the way that I perceived the world. That affected the way that I sought attention. That affected the way that I wanted to be liked. And I wanted to be liked a lot. Uh, I, could, I could tell you that I was a pretty terrible kid. Um, I was in trouble every second of every day. I was given every punishment any kind of institution could give a person all the time. And I, I cherished that. I thought that was great. Uh, because to some degree, there was this, this beautiful negative attention that I got. And uh, it was like the closest thing to really belonging. I started drinking when I went back home to Romania. I was 10 years old, and my cousins found out that I had American money, which is significantly more than shitty Romanian money. And, uh, and they were like, come out with us. Like it's, you know, we're going to celebrate. You're a man now at 10. <laughs> which means, come on, we're broke. We need you. And... Um, and that night I started, I really did start feeling like an adult. I started feeling like I, I belonged to something elevated. Because there was people all around me shaking my hand. And there was people cheering when I did something stupid. And I can't tell you that I remember exactly the, the experience of drinking, but I remember the experience of, of what I thought was camaraderie. And that was something I wanted forever. And within a few years, things had gotten to a point that is almost unspeakable. Uh, I think the difficult thing about drinking when you're young is that you already don't know how to live. Like you don't know how to be a person. You have no shot when every moment of every day you're also checked out of reality. When I was 14 years old, I got arrested at my middle school, and it didn't sink in at that point that this was something that didn't happen to everybody. When I was 15 years old, I stopped going to school because, well, I didn't need it. That didn't sink in, that that wasn't something that just didn't happen to everybody. The, uh, the point that I had gotten to is that I had lost my sense of any personality, any identity. I kind of was whoever you needed me to be. I wasn't invited to a lot of things, but I was everywhere. And that didn't occur to me, that that wasn't something that everyone went through. Luckily, I have pretty amazing parents uh, who had some sort of idea that this doesn't happen to everybody. And uh, on December 3rd, 2009, I got 
taken from my house. I got transported to a uh, long-term residential center. And I was upset, and rightfully so. Nobody should be taken from their home at 4 in the morning. Um, but I remember it set in really, really fast that this was something I needed, like maybe in a few days. Because when I met other children that were put in a place like I was in a behavioral modification rehabilitation center, I was like, oh, we're not like everybody else. <laughs> we're fundamentally wrong. Between eight of us, we can't do like two chores in one day. <laughs> and we're all forced to be sober, functionally useless. And I think, you know, no matter how you get into these rooms, it's great that we're here, but when you kind of get dropped in, you're forced to look at yourself from an angle that you, you've been avoiding your whole life. You've been dodging the mirror for as often as you can, and then it hits you right there, that you have no concept of your own self-worth, that you have no idea what you bring to the table because you've never thought about that before. And sobriety forces you to ask a lot of really hard questions about yourself. Uh, and that's something that I feel like a lot of people here struggle with if you've gotten sober young. I got sober when I was 15. Um, I didn't know anything when I was 15. I don't know anything. I'm 20. I don't know anything right now. <laughs> and it, it forced me to take a look at myself in this way that I never wanted to, but absolutely needed to. My life was on the line with these questions and these steps and everything. I actually didn't have uh, AA in the, the treatment center that I was at. It was a you know, behavioral modification, but when I had 11 months in the place, we got a furlough home, and I went to uh, a young people's meeting. And it was really small, it was like eight people, so they all had sufficient time to just vomit their whole lives at me. And I didn't necessarily want to be there, but I agreed because I didn't have anything else going on. Um, and from the beginning to the end of that meeting was the most drastic change that had ever happened to me in my life. I was maybe a little potentially open-minded at the beginning of that meeting, but mostly just looking at people and wondering why they have this fire, this sort of passion in their eyes, whatever's going on. And by the end of that meeting, I realized that these people didn't have perfect lives. These people had very regular lives. And they were way too fucking happy. <laughs> I'm serious. It was amazing. It was this dead realization that hit me that, oh, they still have taxes and parents and whatever, burdens, and they are so unbelievably happy. I have the capacity to find the smallest inconvenience and turn that into the worst thing in my life and then tell other people about it. <laughs> and this blew my mind. And they took me out to go get coffee afterwards and gave me cigarettes and hugs, and, and it was amazing. And when I got out of uh, rehab the next month, all I did was go to young people's meetings. I lived here. I slept in those chairs and then picked them up at the end. <laughs> I had a, a, a period where you hear that, that phrase, you know, I grew up in these rooms. I grew up in public. I grew up in public. I was 16 years old, and there was people when I got my year sober chip that were congratulating me on also getting my driver's license. When I got my three years sober, there was people congratulating me on graduating high school. I grew up in public, and that's an experience that, that changed my life in so many ways. I, I, I probably can't even still conceptualize it. At first, it felt like there was a magnifying glass of sort of criticism and kind of different things on the aid of who I was as a person. And then I realized that I had the most beautiful opportunity to have a hundred parents all the time. When you phrase it like that, it sounds really bad. But <laughs> I had a hundred teachers all the time. And I think, uh, I think getting sober young is, it's no more difficult than getting sober at any other age. There is a different set of circumstances for each and every person. I think getting sober young for me uh, 
was particularly interesting because I still was figuring out my code as a person, still figuring out who I was and what I stood for, what ethics and morals and, and things I had, what I thought about the world. And I also had this big monolithic thing that was like, this is important. You live to serve. Work these steps. These are also your ethics and morals. So I feel to a degree that AA has been ingratiated in my personality, which is a, a pretty great thing. You find, I, I got to find out an age where you discover what you're interested in, that I'm interested in being helpful to anybody that can be. And that's a, it's a marvelous realization because I am not that person, not even a little bit. I don't care about any of you on my best day without this program. And I need to help all of you on my worst day in this program. And that's amazing. The concept of service work was introduced into my life really early on. And um, luckily I got to do a lot of young people's service and I was welcomed in with open arms. Um, and the most important thing about that to me was that none of the service sounded appealing. It was not one thing that I was like, oh, I can't wait to do this on my Friday night. It must be great to give this guy a ride 45 minutes away. Awesome. And none of it, none of it sounded fun. And all of it, albeit sometimes difficult or strenuous or emotionally tasking, matters so much to me. When my brain didn't need any of the things that were going on, my soul craved it. I had to be of use because I had done so much damage before. I had to restore that spiritual axiom that we talk about. It was also very important for me to be involved in the fellowship in any way that I could, to call as many people as I could, to find out about your lives, to tell you about mine. Because there was no... There was no time when I could be without the program for too long and something terrible might happen, always of my own doing. I actually even got to experience the concept of hitting sober bottoms, quite a few, sometimes in succession. It starts when you're like, I don't really want to go to the meeting this week and, or this month or this quarter. And then you find out that you are still capable of the worst decisions of the world like that. And it's, uh, it's all been an amazing process. It's all been this really great thing with uh, wonderful experiences, each of which that I get to learn from. I think the, uh, one of the greatest realizations that I had was that my mistakes were these things to be cherished. Because I have the ability to learn from other people, I guess. But it's, I can count on like one hand the amount of times that I have. I like really need to put my hand in a wood chipper to find out that it's a wood chipper. I'm very, very bad about having grace and saying that, oh, you, this didn't work for you? Oh, I'm not very special. It might not work for me. In fact, I think the opposite of that. I'm very vocal about it. But it's great. It's a marvelous experience to be able to not be mortifyingly afraid of your mistakes because they're all these sort of like blessings that you get to blossom into who you are. You get to turn them into aspects of your personality that can be great. And I don't know of another thing that lets me do that. I don't know of another program or fellowship or group of people. That's wonderful. That's irreplaceable for me. So I'm, I'm fortunate that I had a, a wonderful experience where people welcomed me, uh, I didn't feel too out of touch, even when I was the youngest person in the meetings by whatever, decades. Um, I felt that I had more in common with these people than others that I'd known my whole life. It's, I like to call it trauma bonding. When we've got something that we, we don't even, like two vets that have been in a war together, they don't even know each other's name. But we have something in common. We've shared this experience that like frightened us to our core. And because we have that, we can get through anything together. That's wonderful to me. I get to have that with people on elevators here in hotels. 
I think, uh, I think I cherish the fact that I get to learn every second of every day because I was completely oblivious to that before. I think the uh, aspects of my bottom, I didn't lose a whole lot of things. I didn't have a whole lot of things to lose. The aspects of my bottom that are terrifying upon looking back were that I didn't have the faculties to, to be in touch with reality. I didn't have a choice in that. Showing up to my life was not an option. I was showing up to something else, to anything else. And today I have that. I can be shitty and not do it, but I have that option. I can put on my shoes and go to work, go to school, go to the places that I have to be. I don't even have to have too much creative thought about it. I just have to show up. That's beautiful. I didn't, I didn't have that choice before. Today I get to look at other people, strangers even sometimes, and try to figure out where I get to fit in in their life. What action that I take has what ripple on their existence. And that's mind-blowing. That's the antithesis of what do they have? When are they going to the bathroom? I need to take that thing. I never imagined that I would get to make a turn so drastic, to change so much that I, I care about people that I might not even learn their names in the time that I interact with them. I think it's wonderful that I get to come into a room full of strangers from all different corners of the country and the world and know that we have the capacity to be very, very close because we all share this common bond, that we all have common ideals, that we all have the same message. And I think it's amazing that I learned about taking action, which has been really my, my, my final solution in all the problems that I've ever had. It's probably the most important thing to me that I get to be engaged in existence. It's something that I feel kind of fortunate that I got to get early on. And if anybody has ever struggled with the concept that you got sober young, maybe you don't belong, you feel it's difficult to qualify your story compared to the person next to you, you can have that thought. It's yours to have. I've never known it to be advantageous. I've never had that thought and, and found that my day got better. Maybe drinking would work for me. I don't think I ever want to find that out, though. There's no looking at my track record and saying, oh, yeah, see, there, right there. That's when I got better. <laughs> I'd like to think that I never have to go back to that kind of way of living again. I don't have any pressure from this fellowship that maybe I don't fit in, that maybe I don't qualify. And that's, that's a blessing. Maybe that didn't get to happen for people like me 20 years ago. It gets to happen today. We get to speak here today. Anyway, that's all I have. I hope that you guys found it to some degree relatable. Thank you so much for letting me be here. All right, thank you so much. Um, I will now introduce our final speaker before my final really witty remarks, um, Stella B. from New York. Uh, thanks so much, Rachel, for having me. Uh, my name is Stella. I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Stella. Uh, okay. Um, I'm so grateful this is happening so I can maybe think about something else for the next six months and try to be useful. Um, and thank you, Jessica and Radu, for your talks. It was really great. Um, it's very echoey in here. Uh, I'm from New York. My home group's name is Atlantic Group, and a lot of them came out today. So uh, I'm really grateful for that. We meet seven nights a week in Manhattan if you're ever in town. I have a sponsor. His name is Zach. 
Um, he's old. He's 32. So, <laughs> but he came to the meeting anyway to support. Um, and uh, and I've been sober since March 7th, 2010. Um, oh, thanks. Uh, and I was 15 and a half when I got sober. The half is actually very important uh, to me. And I've done the steps, and I'm working on step nine, and I try to practice steps 10, 11, and 12 uh, to the best of my ability every day. It's definitely not perfect, but uh, easily the best part of my life is sponsoring other people, and, and that's been a huge privilege, which I've really started to experience um, recently more than ever. So. Yeah, this topic is great. I was very concerned when I got sober that maybe it wasn't enough. You know, maybe I didn't do enough. I heard all these stories, and um, I wasn't sure if I related. I related to the way that they felt, but they all seemed older, and I never really drank in a bar. I kind of drank in the park and in my room and strangers' houses, and and I heard all these names of liquors I'd never heard of, and I just felt like maybe this isn't for me, you know, but I was in enough pain and uh, to take some action. And I'm really glad I stayed. And if you're new and you're wondering at any age, maybe I don't belong here, uh, just try to get hooked up with a sponsor and, uh, you know, start going through the steps because that's really what changed my life. I hit bottom, you know, when I came in to Alcoholics Anonymous, but uh, I stuck around here for two years and didn't do the program. Like, I was in AA, I went to meetings every day, um, I had service commitments, and I didn't do the steps. And I ended up in, like, a psychiatric hospital <laughs> when I had two years. And I was telling everyone in there how to stay sober. <laughs> and I, the worst part is I believed myself. Like, I believed I had something of value to say. And... Um, and I did not, uh, is the truth of that. I just had no experience doing the steps. I had, I had stuck around in AA, and I had gotten worse. You know, this disease is progressive whether I'm drinking or not. And the way that I felt in those two years was literal hell. Um, it was worse than when I was drinking, and I felt pretty bad then. So I'm just going to back up a little. Like I said, I'm from New York. I grew up on the upper, upper west side, as we call it. And... Um, and it's a, it's a nice place. I have uh, two wonderful parents, a sister who's here, and she's sober, and that's amazing. And uh, oh, she gets applause. <laughs> so, uh, which is such a gift. And, um, yeah, I really uh, had nothing to complain about, but I sure did a lot. And um, I, I, I felt very uncomfortable all the time. I was filled with fear. And I also had like this incredible inflated sense of self and like self-worth and importance, um, like a huge ego. And it paralyzed me. I, I couldn't keep a diary. Like all my friends kept diaries in elementary school. And I, I really couldn't because I would just tear out the pages and start again, you know, in case someone published it after I died or something. And, <laughs> and it was just like, I, I couldn't seemed to like fit into the world in the right way. I talked so much. I mean, like my form of self-centeredness, I thought I couldn't be self-centered because I kind of exuded what I then thought might be confidence, you know, but I really just had to put a show on all the time. And and someone once told me like, you know, if you stop talking, you're not going to disappear. And um, that was hurtful, but true. (laughs) And um, so I just talked and talked and talked and put on a show, and I love to, like, sing and dance, and, um, you know, I I still kind of like to do that, but um, it was it was all to, to, co- to cover up, you know, who I really was, and I was sure I was a very, very bad person right from the get-go, and there was something wrong with me, and people knew, you know. I mean, I was obsessed with, like, natural disasters, and the Titanic, like I just loved catastrophe (laughs) and the idea of like one day you're here and then you're like wiped away for infinity. (laughs) And, um, you know, so that was appealing to me, just like total oblivion, total oblivion. Because how do you, how do you know how to like speak to people, right? How do you know how to go to school? Um, how do you know how to get through the day? I, I didn't have the answers for any of that. 
And to me, it seemed like everyone else did, which they probably didn't in the fourth grade. Like, I don't think everyone was as well adjusted as I saw them to be. But I knew that, that I was not well adjusted. And although I didn't have the words for it at that time. So when I found alcohol, it was perfect. Uh, you know, I, I don't remember my first drink. I'm pretty sure it was at a bar mitzvah. But I remember the first time I intentionally, like, drank alone. And I took an airplane bottle of absolute vodka from my parents' freezer, which they never really drank. I'm not sure why they had it. And I took a couple sips, and it was like, tasted like rubbing alcohol. But it was a good feeling, and I, I went to sleep that night and felt kind of comfortable and not as scared for the next day, you know, in the sixth grade, um, which is a terrifying place to be if you're me. And, um... <laughs> You know, I, I was so young, I like filled the bottle back up with water because I didn't really have like the cognitive ability to be like, oh, it's in the freezer because vodka does not freeze, but water does. And, um, you know, so I'm sure my parents knew something had happened there. So it was a frozen <laughs> bottle of vodka. Um, and, you know, my story is, my story is not that interesting or, or crazy although I kind of thought it was when I got sober. Being young has nothing to do with me being an alcoholic. I'm so glad that was explained to me. There's literally nothing special about my alcoholism. Um, you know, the only thing that I'm, I'm super grateful for in regards to that is that the bottom was raised for me, so I got to come in and experience this life so I didn't have to die. And that happened way before I got sober. You know, people were doing that decades before me. And I'm forever grateful for that. And... Um, you know, so it, so it got bad very quickly. Uh, I had, like, my first mini-intervention uh, my sophomore year of high school. And all I had to do was stop drinking for, like, a couple months, you know, just to get the heat off my back and my parents to leave me alone. Like, just a couple months I had to stop drinking. Um, and I couldn't do it. Like, I could not stop. Uh, I would stop for a few days. I was, like, counting days, kind of, but only for certain things. So I'd be like, I haven't drank in 10 days, except I drank last night. But besides that, 10 days. <laughs> and um, so I don't, I don't really know. I started Googling, like, AA, you know, and I took the tests. And I was kind of, like, getting this result, like, yeah, you're an alcoholic. And um, I didn't, I wasn't sure I believed that. I thought I was kind of crazy, you know, and drinking might be a symptom of that. But... Um, you know, after a few months of trying to stop and not being able to, I, I really, really wanted to stop. And I wasn't just doing it to get my parents off my back. I was like, I, I don't like the way I feel um, when, I, when I drink and I can't stop. You know, and I don't like that I keep making the decision, or so I thought, you know, to keep picking up. And, um, and, and even when I really, really wanted to, I couldn't. And... Um, you know, it took me to a really dark place. The consequences were getting worse, although that has nothing to do with me being an alcoholic. The consequences were bad. Um, my health was very, very bad. I couldn't seem to get to school or, like, take a shower or um, tell the truth ever. Um, I was stealing thousands of dollars from my family and liquor and lying and lying and, and failing drug tests that were, you know, mandated for me, and um, I just didn't know what was wrong with me, you know. I'm super grateful to my parents. They, like, staged an intervention with a therapist I was seeing at the time, and I, like, love drama. If you know me, you probably know that's true. So the intervention was, like, the perfect place to, like, get all that out, that need <laughs> for excitement. So I'm, like, screaming at my parents, and I'm running out of the building, and I'm, like, I'm jumping in the East River, and you did this to me. So it was, like, my shining moment. And, um, thank you for that. So I, uh, so then I had an idea. And I was, like, okay, I just didn't do good enough last time. A few months... You know, I'm no drinking, and, and they won't bother me. So if I go back and I say, I'm really sorry, and I'm going to stop drinking, like, they're not going to send me away. They're not going to take away my phone or my allowance. You know, that's kind of what I lost. Um, and, uh, 
And so I go back in and I'm like sobbing while they're talking to me and I'm not crying because my, my parents are very upset and worried about me. They love me very much. Like I'm crying because I can't believe I just didn't get away with it. You know, and I'm like, I must be a sociopath. I must be heartless because I'm watching my parents cry and I'm like, I don't care. I just wish you would let me drink the way that I want to. So I'm like, I don't know, something's very, very wrong. And they sent me to an outpatient program for teens, which I also really shined there. It was like delinquent (laughs) high school. It was so fun. And, um, you know, and the most important thing was they brought in AA. They brought in Alcoholics Anonymous to this place. And one person in the outpatient was sober. <laughs> like, one person. I would, and he was like, hey, you should come to AA with me. You can say whatever you want, and they will clap for you and say, keep coming back. <laughs> I mean, I was sold, right? That sounds amazing. But he, he did what we do here. He 12 stepped me. You know, he told me what AA was and wasn't. And he described his alcoholism and the way that he drank, and I was able to identify with that. And I don't know what happened to him, really. We lost touch after a couple of years, but he really helped save my life. So I started going to these meetings, and I was very quick to let you know how old I was, but that I was actually an alcoholic. I deserved to be here. And, um, you know, I had all this drama, and I would come 20 minutes late, take the burning desire, and then leave before anyone could talk to me. And, um, you know, my life got a little bit better, right? Like, my health wasn't failing anymore, and my parents kind of trusted me. I got, like, $5 of cash a day, which was good enough, and a Metro card. And, um, and I got very, like, confused about what I was doing in AA, because I had a new life, you know? And um, I didn't have to drink anymore. I kind of felt like killing myself most of the time, but that was, that was better than all of the time, which had kind of been my experience for many years. Uh, I fell in love in rehab, and that was just a whole operation. And, you know, and I had this group of friends, and we're running around to AA, and I'm going to meetings every single day, and I'm doing service, and I'm like a young people's circuit speaker. I'm saying nothing of any value. I can't speak at step meetings because I've only done one, two, and three, kind of. You know, and I really just wanted to kill myself. And like I said, I ended up in a facility. And someone asked me one day after I was sharing at the AA meeting they brought in, being like, it's so great, you have 90 days to the speaker. I have two years. And um, (laughs) with my hospital bracelet on. And someone was like, if you know so much about AA and it's worked for you, why are you here? I was like, well, you got me there, you know? Like, I had nothing to say to that. I had nothing to say to that. I was so miserable. And um, I I came back to New York from this place. I was in Connecticut. And um, and this time, just like when I wanted to stop drinking, I wanted to change. And I thought I was going to do it. You know, I thought there were willing people in AA and unwilling people. And I was just unwilling. And maybe that was my curse. Because I didn't really know what willingness was. I thought willingness was like these people who looked really happy and shiny and they were so excited to be here and I would never be that. Um, But what I found out was willingness for me today is just the ability um, to try something different and show up no matter how I feel. My feelings aren't the most important thing. Like I was plotting my escape from the country this morning when I realized I was going to speak in a couple hours. And like I'm willing today. I just got in the shower and came here. And I didn't have to, like, escape because I'm so full of fear that people won't like me. Um, So I couldn't change, and um, I wanted to, and no one would sponsor me because I wasn't being sponsored. I would, like, show up an hour late to step work and be like, I fell asleep. I'm sorry. And and I got hooked up with a sponsor um, at a time where I was really, really desperate. I had no friends. I had a failing relationship, still the same one from rehab. <laughs> and I had almost three years sober, and I was pretty sure I was going to leave AA and drink or just kill myself, save myself the trouble of trying to find alcohol. So I was still, you know, 18. And, um, and I, I told him my story. I asked him to sponsor me because I had, like, a conspiracy theory against the women in my group. And, um, and... I told him my story, 
And I'm like, well, I don't really know. Like, maybe I'm not an alcoholic because I've got, I've been acting so crazy these past few years. They've diagnosed me with like four psychiatric illnesses and maybe that's my problem. And I got sober really young, so it's kind of difficult for me, like more difficult than other people. And, you know, he just had none of that, like zero. And he said, you know, I'm an alcoholic. I know about alcoholism. I know about the 12 steps. I've been taken through them as they're outlined in the big book. And if you want, you know, I can take you through those steps and try to put your hand in God's, a God that's going to keep you sober. I was like, whoa, you know, that sounds intense. And, um, (laughs) but like, I had no other options. I had no other options. That's complete defeat. Where was I to go? Why would I want to do any of this stuff if I really didn't believe that I would be dead without it? I don't think I would. Um, So I was defeated, and I was pretty sure the 12 steps wouldn't work, but I was going to do them anyways, because then I could at least say that I did them and they didn't work. And from this place of, like, complete defeat and humiliation, right, I was humiliated going to a mental hospital while you're in AA and coming back and seeing all these people... That I, that I just thought, okay, I'm going to try it, and maybe I don't know everything in the world. And that was open-mindedness and willingness, and the honesty was difficult, but it came, you know? So I started to go through these steps, and I went through the first step, and I realized I'm an alcoholic, not because I got sober when I was 15, not because all this crazy stuff was happening, but because, like, when I drink, I cannot stop. And even though I know what happens to me when I drink, I keep picking up, so therefore I'm doomed. Like, I'm doomed to die of chronic alcoholism because that cycle will keep going forever. And I felt doomed. You know, I remember reading the doctor's opinion with my sponsor in, like, a pizzeria in Times Square, and it was a blizzard. I was walking to the corner to get a taxi in the blizzard, and um, he's, like, 30 feet away, and we just read the doctor's opinion, and he turns around, and he's like, Stella, I'm like, What? It's like, you're doomed. Remember, you're doomed. (laughs) And you know what? I felt doomed, especially in that circumstance. Because I did not know what he was on about. But but I felt it. Like, I felt like, okay, I have to do this because there's no other choice for me. And the thing is that the steps worked in spite of me. Like, Alcoholics Anonymous works. The good news is, I'm not a unique case at all. I just did the work the way that my sponsor told me to do, to the best of my ability. And um, stuff started to change, like, quickly. Nothing had changed in two and a half years. And I thought, like, oh, long, slow recovery, slow sobriety, whatever this stuff I had heard that justified (laughs) me not doing anything, you know? And within a few months, I couldn't get up before 1 p.m., and I was calling my sponsor at 7.30 in the morning. What? You know, like, that's Alcoholics Anonymous. And I was showing up to the meeting early, and I wasn't happy, and I kind of wanted to die, but I was showing up. And and then one day I was like, huh, like, it's 11 a.m. I haven't thought about killing myself yet. And I had people calling on my phone, which no one had ever called me before, really. And then I had people calling me for help, which I was like, are you sure you want it for me? And then, like, I got to start making amends, because I had done this, like, fourth and fifth step that I wrote in, like, two weeks. I was given a week, but it took two weeks. And um, it had, like, 250 names on it, and a lot of them from sobriety, because I'd just been so angry and and filled up with this stuff. And um, it was honest and thorough for the first time, and then I got to go and start making amends to all these people on my list who I found out that I had actually hurt, and I found out I was actually selfish and self-centered, which I thought you could not be if you hated yourself, So if you're here and you're thinking, like, why are they telling me I'm selfish? If the only thing you think about is hating yourself, you probably are self-centered like me. Um, Because that's really the only thing I could think about was, like, me and my problems and the way the world had hurt me and everything that was wrong with me. Um, You know, and uh, and then I, I was taken through the rest of the book, and my sponsor said I had to start looking for sponsees. And, um... I was like, I have no idea what to tell them, you know? And he was like, well, just tell them what I told you. We take them through the exact same way. And I didn't fully understand what we were doing here in AA until the first time a sponsee called me. And I could, like, hear my sponsor's voice coming out of mine. I was like, okay, you know, first things first, go to a meeting. I'm like, whoa, you know? And, like, what AA is came together for me. 
It's just about finding God and helping others. And I had heard that many times, but this time I was experiencing it, and I had experienced helping other people. And I realized that listening to some other psycho talk for five minutes kind of quieted down that psycho babble in my own brain. You know, because it's like 24-7 psycho, drama, you know, art, music, like whatever I think is like so involved in me. And um, having a reprieve from that is life-saving. I mean, I've screamed out loud, like, stop it to my own head, you know, pacing around in my apartment. And um, to be able to, like, take all that dark past that I thought was so embarrassing and pass it on to someone else as my own experience and then tell them how I got through that has been the greatest gift, you know? So, so I hit bottom, right? And from there, I got to go through with the rest of the 11 steps. After admitting my powerlessness, my life was certainly unmanageable. And it's changed my life. A, it's changed my life. I can't believe I'm at the international convention. My first year sober... Um, you know, it was in Texas, and, and I almost went, and, and to be sober at the next one, I did not think I would be sober at the next one. Um, it's been the greatest gift uh, to come here and be with my home group and, and my sponsor and my family and my friends. And, um, you know, I'll just close with, like, I did not think this would work, and I did think I was the exception. And if you feel that way, I understand, you know, but, but the program um, has worked for 80 years, and, um, and the amazing thing is once I could look past, like, my own nonsense and try a different way, it worked for me, and it continues to work for me. And I know that as long as I keep working the program and trying to help someone else and getting out of, you know, Stella and what I think, um, that I have a really good shot of staying sober and never having to drink again, being 15 and not having to go out and drink ever again. Um, So AA has given me that promise, and I'm really grateful. Thanks. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.